Okay. Next talk is Fabio talking about deep learning on Hobbes Hadoop. So hi everyone, I'm Fabio. Uh, I work for a company called Logical Cox. Uh, we are a startup based in uh, Stockholm and we are the leading company behind the Hobbes Hadoop platform. And today we are going to show you how, how you scale deep learning workloads on our platform basically. So uh, a bit of a step back, um, the project was born like a couple of years back with uh, uh, OpsFS. Uh, OpsFS is basically uh, a fork of Apache HFS. Um, the difference between OpsFS and the main difference between OpsFS and um, Apache HFS is that we took the metadata of the file system, which in HFS are stored in the name node, and we put them in a distributed uh, in-memory database. And this allows us to scale both in terms of like uh, space and like files we can store, and in terms of throughput. Uh, just to be clear, this is not like you know some random vendor vendor numbers. We uh, actually uh, these are like research and uh, with like recognition both from academia and the industry. So uh, on top of that, so on top of the file system, and uh, actually we also have a fork of of Yarn, which is like the Hadoop uh, uh, resource manager and cluster manager. We we fork it because uh, right now. Yarn yeah, doesn't support like scheduling of GPUs. It's coming. It's coming in, in a couple of next reads, and we do have it in, in OpsYarn. On top of like OpsHadoop, uh, in, on top of OpsFS and OpsYarn, we build like a like entire platform, and you can find basically everything, all the software you, you will expect from a big data platform. But we also want to provide deep learning uh, solutions, so we also uh, have the support for TensorFlow. And on top of that, we have uh, well Jupyter and Zeppelin to you know write your code. And the whole platform is organized basically in projects. And you can think about like uh, GitHub projects. So you have like users can collaborate on multiple projects. Multiple projects can like have data shared like across different projects and so on and so forth. Everything is just like a REST API. So you can build your own applications uh, on top of uh, OpsHadoop. And we just released the 0 0.3 version. So you can go and check it out. I will have a link at the end of the slides. So as I said, uh, we want to provide like deep learning solutions. Um, and when it comes to deep learning, Python is basically the winner. Uh, we are allow people to run deep learning uh, on, on Ops Hadoop by using um, Conda repositories. Basically, uh, each project has its own Conda environment. Uh, each, like users can install on their project whatever libraries they want. And then they will be able to like use those libraries from Spark and from uh, TensorFlow. And we see that these two are quite connected. Besides that, we develop our own uh, uh, Python library that surprise is called Ops Python library. And the thing that this, this library does a bunch of stuff. Uh, the main thing is that it allows you to like do hyperparameter searching for your models and uh, manage the TensorBoard lifecycle. I, I will show an example later. Uh, how you can do that. Now, you, you have the platform, you have all the tools, um, you have some maybe some good ideas, and we develop uh, this thing as actually like a, a PhD student uh, working really hard on and getting uh, this, uh, this tool done. It's basically Dela. The idea of Dela is that you organize your clusters, your ops cluster in a peer-to-peer -peer network, and they can basically exchange data sets uh, with each other. And the idea is that if you, let's say, you have like your new like image, uh, image recognition net, net, neural network and you want to try out, you can go on the network, grab ImageNet, and then you, you are good to go and you can you know, start training and start seeing how good your, uh, is your network. Or on the other hand, if you have like a cool data set or you, have done, you, you did like a cool experiment, you can like register your data set with the network and then uh, people can start using it and start doing more experiments, basically. The nice thing about this is that uh, the old protocol is based in U on UDP, and the idea is that we don't want to impact like production traffic going on your, on your on your cluster. So uh, the the tools li listens for like traffic on the network. If it is empty, then start transferring the the data set. Otherwise, it just backs off and let your production traffic going on. So um, you do have your platform, you do have your data, and then. You build your own model, and your model will have probably like hyperparameters, uh, and you want to look what is the like good combination of hyperparameters uh, to use the right, right right combinations. What you can do is doing uh, you you can do like hyperparameter searching in parallel uh, with the Ops Python library, 
the idea is the following. You, 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 you take your, uh, your TensorFlow model and you put it into this, uh, into this function. You define some, uh, like a dictionary of values of saying, okay, I want to test these learning rates, I want to test these dropout values. Um, this is actually optional. You can say, uh, in this case, you say, okay, let's try like a grid, and so let's try 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 45, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, 45, and so on and so forth, like in a, in a grid manner. And then you import this TF launcher, which comes down with the uh, ops library, and you say, launch this model with this uh, grid, and what this basically does is the following. Uh, it uses Spark to go to Yarn and request like six different executors in this case, and will launch your TensorFlow, uh, the TensorFlow model and run your TensorFlow model for you uh, uh, on the cluster. The nice thing is that Spark is now aware of like, uh, that can go to, um, to Yarn and ask for, uh, and ask for GPUs. So your model, like your, your all experiments can have it run on, on one or multiple GPUs basically. Besides that, uh, TensorFlow, TensorFlow uh, Launcher will actually launch it for you like a, um, like a TensorBoard, which is basically, for those of you who don't know what TensorBoard is, is basically like a nice visualization UI where you can basically track like uh, how your experiments are going. And so on the end of the, on the, end of the execution, you will probably see, and so let's say you were tracking the accuracy of the model, you will be able to see uh, which of these combination of hyperparameters gives you back like the, the, uh, the best accuracy basically. Now, you have your model, you have data, and so on. Now you want to like really like scale out in the sense of like you want to go like distributed training and train on the on the full size data set. Now, when it comes to distributed TensorFlow, distributed TensorFlow is actually designed to be used with uh, like a cluster manager. Uh, you have to start all the processes. You have to tell each process which uh, where all the other processes are, and so on and so forth. So you either want to use uh, Kubernetes, Mesos, or in our case, as we are in the Hadoop world, we use Yarn again. And we exploit basically the same fact that we were doing before with TensorFlow Launcher, and we use Spark to actually distribute the code, allocate the resources, and start the process for you, basically. We use a tool actually open source by, by Yahoo. It's called TensorFlow and Spark. And the idea is that Spark is used to, as I said, uh, request resources from Yarn. Uh, it's used to um, start the processes and it's used also to um, distribute the, your, your code to, to, to all the workers, basically. We actually fork the TensorFlow and Spark, uh, mainly because, again, uh, OpsYAN supports a GPU, uh, exclusive GPU allocations. So you basically, like, this TensorFlow, no, our version of TensorFlow and Spark can request uh, GPUs, basically, for you. And uh, there is another, like, a minor improvement, well, minor, not really minor, the idea is that parameter servers, which are effectively a like Spark executor, will not get the GPU because they don't need it. So it's like a waste of resources, basically. And again, uh, TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow Spark will manage for you the, the tensor board, basically. These are, this is how, basically, you, you run everything. Uh, again, you, you wrap all your model inside this training function. Inside the training function, function you call this T, TF node. Start cluster server. This will give you back like an object telling you, okay, am I like a worker? Am I a parameter server? And then that you, you take action basically. Uh, and then you call this TF uh, cluster. You basically give you the Spark context. Uh, give you like it, it gives like you give yeah. You have to give like the training function, the number of executors, and the number of parameter servers you want. If you go on this link, like there is a like official guide from Yahoo uh, telling you how you can transform like normal TensorFlow code, uh, normal distributed TensorFlow code to the uh, TensorFlow on Spark. Now, the problem is that um, when you are scaling out the sense of like you are uh, training with a lot of GPUs, thank you, um, the parameter server architecture doesn't really scale because uh, especially if you have like large model, like VGC 16, which I think the weights are like 500 megabytes, something like that, um, network becomes a bottleneck. Every, every, every worker, every GPU uh, has to communicate with the parameter server at the end of each iteration. So you really, uh, you really can't scale, basically. These are, uh, uh, these are experiments done by, by Uber. Um, Uber wrote this tool called Autobot. And the idea of Autobot is the following. They actually built on top of like, uh, work done at Baidu. 
And the idea is that you don't you don't have like a centralized architecture, but you have like a, uh, you organize your workers in, in a ring basically. Uh, it's uh, again uh, it's um, data parallelism, so each worker gets his own gets his own batch of, of, of data you want to train. And uh, the idea is that when the when, when the when the when the when the work is done, the Updated gradients are distributed through all, through all the workers using the all reduce uh, all reduce uh, algorithm. Just a quick recap of all the reduce algorithm works. Basically, you have like these three GPUs, let's say, and you have like um, your gradients, let's say, and you divide it by th in three batches because you have three GPUs. And the idea is the following: uh, seamlessly, you you. GPU 1 submits to GPU 2, GPU 2 submits to GPU 3, GPU 3 submits to GPU uh, 1 again. You do that twice, and at the end of the, the first round, the first like the first two, uh, two rounds, you will have like one GPU that has like uh, each GPU has one of the um, one of the chunks of the of the greens that it has to transmit uh, in the final state. You do another two iterations, and you have every every GPU has the the updated gradients for for the next iteration basically. But as I said, uh, this is like a synchronous protocol. So before the next iteration, all the all the transmissions has to be completed, and this means that you uh, do, you want to have like uh, as homogeneous as possible GPUs and as, as, as homogeneous as possible a uh, network. So let's say you have like uh, I don't know ten links, and you have like nine InfiniBand and one Ethernet. Uh, then you are wasting the InfiniBand because all the workers will wait until tra the, the transfer between the two. Um, work to connect through, through internet uh, are finished. One optimization you can have in, in this system is the following. So if you have a, like a neural network and then you are doing like the, um, the computing the, the, the errors basically, the gradients update for the last uh, or, or the, the external so to say, um, external layers are available much earlier than actually the, the gradients update for the, for the first layers. So you can start transmitting the gradients update for the last, last layers before actually having computed the, the gradients for the first layers. So you can get more, uh, more performance, basically. So this is how you use it. Uh, there is like a full support for all the use uh, on, 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 on Opsadu, basically. Uh, the idea is the following. Uh, you write a Jupyter notebook, um, including all your code. Again, you have to do some minor modifications to your code. One thing is you have to feed your optimizer into this uh, all of a distributed optimizer, and you have to tell well each worker the position in the ring, so he knows to 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 which other worker it has to send the gradients and from which worker it will receive the gradients. You wrap everything in a notebook, as I said, and then from another notebook, notebook you call this all reduce lunch Spark, and you give the notebook path, and this again will transform your notebook in a Python program, execute and train. And we show you the, uh, the TensorBoard, TensorBoard uh, login, basically. I do have like a quick demo of the old platform. Uh, how much time do I have left? Five. OK. Six. Which one is there? Uh, no, no, no. Do you know what? <laughs> yeah, I know. But there are like four of them. Not this one. Did it die? Now oh, we can open another one. Let me just put it again. Yeah. I know it's in full screen, right? Ah, OK. OK. So this is uh, our, like, we have, like, a, like a production uh, cluster with, uh, with the, the, the platform installed. And what you can do, for instance, like, you, oops, you create a new project. Let's go like so. And the idea is that well, you, we don't need hype, we don't need this one, this one, and this one. Can I go out of the full screen? Yes. Command Oops, control minus. Yeah, okay. Awesome. So now we can, for instance, look for that. So we have a bunch of data sets uh, up, in, up in the cluster. For instance, we can look for how do, OK, quick draw. For instance, 
this is like, okay, this is only 300 gigabytes. We can add this data set to our, to our project. This is gonna be fast, like this is gonna be immediate be just because the data is on the same cluster, so you don't have like the, the transfer uh, to do. But if you, if you were on a different cluster and you were going to this data service, you will be able to see the progress of, of the transferring basically. So once you have your data there, what you can do is you go into the Jupyter notebooks, uh, you say, let's say this TensorFlow, you say, well, I want like, I'm gonna do like six Spark experiments, uh, each, each, uh, each executor for Spark will have one GPU, a bunch of memory, and, and you can start. So the first thing you wanna do maybe is like doing the, the data, for instance, in the quick draw experiments, uh, it's uh, it basically a JSON, um, a JSON entries. And the thing is, what you want to have is that uh, as you're using TensorFlow, you're using maybe expensive GPUs, you want to like minimize the time you actually spend um, doing pre-processing while training. So what you can do is basically if you're using Spark, in this case I'm using Spark, I'm like converting uh, these uh, JSONs basically into some, um, into actually like a data set of TF records. So it's really, it's ready for, 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 for actually training. Then we can go to the uh, we can go to this one, which is basically the um, the API parameter uh, searching. So as I said again, again down the year, say okay, define define a dictionary of possible uh, parameters you you want to test. These parameters are then provided to your training function. Then you say okay, these are the model parameters, and we can test with different dropout values and uh, different uh, learning rate. We can actually run this notebook. And it will take a while to get up. So the tensor board is pretty uh, This one. This one is the TensorFlow Spark notebook. We have like here we have like a, how to ingest the data. You are reading the, the, the tensor um, within the TF record subset. Uh, these are the, like the uh, dataset APIs, which are really cool from, 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 ten, uh, from TensorFlow. This is the model. And then down here we have the uh, basically the the, um, the 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 call I, I was talking to you before, saying, okay, tell me if I if I if I if I am a um, a server or not. You can ask, say, okay, just wait for it. Otherwise, start the process and start training. Here is me, not really super a pro in writing TensorFlow code. It's really ugly, but let's say, let's just skip here. And this is like how you basically run. Yeah, this utils basically comes, down, comes out of the ops library. Say, okay, this is like a number of executor you ask, and this is a number of parameter server you ask for, and you start the training basically. <laughs> say, okay, this number of executor again. This is say, okay, I want, I want you to start TensorFlow for me, uh, TensorFlow for me, and this is the input mode. Uh, you will find like more in the documentation. And finally, we have like the Orbit, uh notebook. Again, same code as before, the network ingestion of the data. Um, here's the one, here's, uh, here's uh, the, the thing I was telling you, you have to specify basically in which, uh, in which position each worker is basically. Say, okay, this is my, my local rank, so to say. And this is a notebook to actually like, uh, to, uh, that contains all the, all the information and all the, all the, uh, the, 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 I'll say the, the code itself. And then you have these notebooks that actually launches the 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 old the old uh, the, old, uh, the old train, and potentially we can see, yeah, yeah, we can see that here the like the for instance this, uh, the six experiments I launched before for doing upper parameter searching, uh, TensorFlow is up, and is showing and showing like uh, uh, some some graphs basically. So I have to wrap up. Uh, yeah. So that's that's it from my side. Um, as I said, we released the 0 0.3 version of the platform. You can go on this link and get like a background machine, like a virtual box machine, so you can try it out. Uh, we have documentation for everything I said on this link. Please start us on, on GitHub if you want, and follow us on, on Twitter. Thank you.
Thank you, Fabio. Time for questions. Thank you for, for the presentation. How do the tools that scales with the number of uh, GPUs? Come again? How that, uh, um, uh, how the tools scales with the number of GPUs? It, we got, we're gonna this one, this, this horrible thing. Yeah, it, it's, it's over that, that managed this. The yeah, yeah the, the, the idea, if you, if you look back to this one, so the, the, the orange is the uh, normal um, parameter server architecture for uh, TensorFlow. And the light blue and the dark blue are um, all of us. The light blue is using TCP. Okay, okay, yeah. the, the, the dark one is actually a little, like lighter, darker blue is using RDMA. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Going once. Twice. Yes. Thanks for the presentation. Would it be suitable to use this kind of uh, approach to run a single machine with multi multiple GPU on it, uh, or would you advise to to use it more to we are multiple uh, uh, machines? Okay, we, we, we are actually uh, use, uh, having like one mach single machine. We are adding another one, for instance, uh, with like 10 GPUs each and running all of it. Okay. And, but yes, you can potentially scale to multiple machines. Okay. I think there was a paper, I think in, in June, from Facebook, they were like using training of uh, ImageNet to around, I think, less than an hour. I don't remember exactly the, 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 the time. And they were using like, the same approach, I think over 256 workers, so 256 uh, GPUs spread off at this point on multiple machines, basically. Okay, thanks. One more? No? Okay. Thank you, Fabio.